the Momo who's silently listening in and making this possible. Um, and last but not least, of course, our facilitator for the evening, uh, Naeem Mohaiman, who, uh, you know, we were floating the idea of a retrospective for at Cinema Akil in March and, you know, uh, given the circumstances had to culminate in this collaboration, which uh, I'm really personally looking forward to. Um, a very quick introduction about Naeem before I hand over. Uh, Naeem was born in London and works in Dhaka, New York. Uh, he combines essays, films, drawings and installations to research utopia, dystopia, slippage through stories of failed insurgencies, incomplete decolonization, redrawn borders and atomized families. Despite sometimes underscoring a historic left tendency towards rec misrecognition of allies, a hope for a future transitional left as the only possible alternative to current silos of race and religion is always a basis for his work. I'm thrilled to have him lead us through Satyajit's work and this inaugural session. Thank you, Naim. Thank you, Buthena, for the invitation and to uh, Luz and Momo for put together. Uh, and thanks for everyone who joined. Um, like all of you, probably I've been on work Zooms, but this is the first, I would say, at least for me, fun Zoom, um, where there's no work done, just uh, art, as we say in Bangla. Um, I think it'd be great to just know who everyone is. Um, I have many of you I don't know, actually. There are a couple of friends on here, but many new faces. And maybe uh, people can just unmute themselves and say who they are. I'm not sure in what sequence to go. Um, so however people want to do it. I can also say who I can see first, like George is on the first screen to my right. I don't know if that's the same for everybody. Hi. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah, George, it would be great Hi. to know um, where you're based, especially what city you're joining us from. And I am. Airport. I'm in Dubai, actually. I'm joining from uh, Dubai Marina here in Dubai. I believe that everybody is in Dubai, uh, but spins on no, no. I'm joining as well with my wife. She's sitting on my left. And uh, I would like to thank Cinema Akil for uh, this uh, initiative. It's really interesting and uh, we, really will, uh, we are really looking forward to, to this session. We did watch the movie last week and uh, really uh, it was more than expected. Uh, I loved it. And I spent the whole night uh, reading about uh, the book behind the, the movie as well. So uh, it was a nice experience. I've never watched an Indian movie dated 30 years ago. I only watched the new Indian movies uh, the last 10 years. <laughs> Which are very different, yeah. Um, um, and uh, yeah, that's it. So uh, uh, how do we go forward now in this discussion? Uh, well, um, I was going to ask the others to introduce themselves also. Um, Jesse, uh, if you could tell us where you're joining from and maybe what you do also, just so we all know. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, Naim. It's to enjoy the program, actually, there. An excellent event. Um, this is Jason, Gajay Jason. Um, I'm a journalist and a writer. So, right now, I'm living in New York. And that's it. That's it. Great. Um, who else to go next? Or I can call on people. Jesse Cumming. Um, thank you. Thank you, Naeem. Um, I'm in Toronto. Excuse me, Toronto, Ontario. Uh, I'm a freelance film programmer and writer. Um, not an expert in South Asian cinema by any means, but I'm fond of Ryan and fond of this film, and this seemed like a great thing to be part of. That's okay. No experts here. <laughs> We're just watching the film as film. Um, Nairi? Uh, yes. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm based in Dubai. I'm a fan of art house cinema and independent cinema. I'm a regular at Cinema Appeal. Buthena knows that. <laughs> um, I very much enjoyed the film. I'd love to discover more of uh, Indian cinema. Uh, non-mainstream or non-Bollywood Indian cinema. Talking about Erfan Khan, actually, I just have to know uh, when you have guys mentioned that, that he passed away, it's very unfortunate. I had seen uh, Lunchbox a few years ago, and it was on that occasion that I got to know who he is, and uh, that was I. That's 
that that film was excellent uh, and i haven't yet seen enough indian cinema other than bollywood so i'm very eager to understand or to know more about this film and the director and the style and so i don't have any opinions on genre when it comes to indian cinema just yet and um, as i said I, i'm not in the cinema industry or in the I'm, I'm from the legal profession or industry, but I'm a very, very big fan of cinema. And uh, I'm very happy actually that Cinema Akhil took this initiative because uh, I've never had the opportunity to discuss films with a group of uh, cinephiles. Great, welcome. Um, Ibrahim? Yeah, hello. Uh, I'm a student. I, I think I, I might be the youngest one here. Uh, and uh, I just saw the movie and I really liked it. So I thought I'd join in the conversation. Welcome. Uh, Shehab? Hi, I'm calling in from Zanzibar. Let's go. A few uh, months ago, and uh, I'm thrilled to be taking part in the conversation. Welcome. Joyce, if you want to say anything about yourself. Sorry, I'm calling on people like a school teacher only because. No, no uh, sorry. Uh, I didn't hear you say the name, so I think I might have a weak connection. Hi, I'm Joyce. I'm calling in from Flanders, Belgium. Antwerp. Uh, I'm a friend of Butena. We met at the Art House Exhibitors Workshop. Um, unfortunately, I misunderstood and I haven't seen the movie. But I'm ah, still coming in because I okay, was. I'm, I'm, I'm hopefully going to be able to show two short clips at the very beginning. Um, uh, so I'll do that right after we finish the introduction. So well, I, that will at least give you a sense of the film. I just watched the first 10 minutes and then I watched the trailer and. I was late. I misunderstood, but um, no worries. very yeah. to be here anyways. Thank you. Welcome. Oh, uh, Tima? No. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no I'm, go a, ahead. I'm a film producer and um, I've been programming films uh, on the side as well. Welcome. Uh, Tima? Oh, there we go. Hi, I'm Tima. I'm calling in from Hudeba in Dubai. I'm an artist and I'm also the studio manager at Tashkil and friends of Busaina, friends of Somji, friend of Shihab. It's nice to see you and Luz. I'm looking forward to this. And you're hosting the next session, correct? I am, yes. Okay, excellent. Uh, uh, Busaina and Kazi Jasin already introduced themselves. So next, Kais Zayed. Yes, hello everyone. I'm Kais Zaid from Tunisia. I'm calling from uh, Tunis, uh, north suburb, uh, from Amarsa, exactly, so the north suburb of Tunis, uh, next to Carthage, where is my, uh, uh, where is the cinema that I manage? It's called Cinema Dar. It's, uh, it's an art house cinema, uh, one of the rare uh, art house cinema in Tunisia. And we are a member of NAS, who is uh, the network of Arab Art House uh, Screens. Uh, we are uh, uh, together with Akril and a lot of Art House cinemas in the Arab world in, the, in this uh, network. And I'm here as a cinephile. I'm not here as a uh, uh, buyer or, or distributor of our uh, program. So I'm happy not to- Don't worry, there's none of that here anyway. <laughs> Maybe after that we will uh, uh, buy the movie and show it in cinema. That don't know. So um, I'm here to join you, and I'm here to be a part of this discussion. Welcome. Um, so there's three of us, I think, here from New York Times Zone. Myself, Kazi Jessin, and Anjali Kamat. Anjali, if you want to say a few words. Hi, I'm Anjali. Um, I'm friends with Naeem. Um, Jessin, it's nice to see your face. We've exchanged a couple emails. <laughs> Um, I am uh, a journalist and a documentary filmmaker, 
and um, you know, delighted to be here. Welcome, Somji. Um, hi everyone. I am uh, Cinema Kiel's biggest fan. I'm also their neighbor. Uh, uh, have a photography center in uh, in El Circle Avenue. I uh, but I'm also here uh, because of you, Naim. I loved the film with Vijay Prashad that I saw in Barcelona, and then before that, I saw uh, your film about the Palestinian Bangladeshi connection in Salt in Istanbul. So I'm uh, I'm excited to kind of be part of this and uh, and then you know uh, talk about the film as well. Thank That's you. Big. You've seen the films in two different look. I think two Spanish subtitles also. Um, yes. uh, but then in Istanbul, Abu Amar is coming. The PLO film, the short film is in English. So it's great. You saw it in two different locations also. Welcome. Um, Nizam, we also talked briefly already, but other people may not know you. So if you want to say something. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Nizam. I'm based in Dubai only. Uh, I come from a South Indian state called Kerala. And uh, I recently uh, discovered Cinema Akil. <laughs> um, I feel sorry about myself. Uh, I, I don't know any of these people except I met uh, Luz a couple of times at Cinema Akil. Uh, that's it. I'm, I'm completely from a different field. I work in uh, food industries. I'm a food technologist uh, by myself. Uh, but back to home, we used to screen uh, independent movies uh, and you know like open film society it's called so and we've been part of the mistress once uh, that's it just an enthusiast thank you and so, thank you, thank you for, yeah. and thank you for reminding us about uh, Irfan Khan's uh, departure the news came very suddenly this morning so thank you for reminding us of that also yeah, um, yeah. and we have one more we have one more person joined Badi Fatu um, if you could just say where you're joining us from and what you do, just so we know each other a little bit, and then we'll start the discussion. Hello, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm based in Dubai, and I have a TV production company. Okay. Welcome. Um, so I'll get uh, the discussion started, because um, I think uh, we have the option to go a little longer towards the end. Um, this is obviously new for me, um, as probably for everyone, which is the action of discussing a film without watching it together in a room. Um, uh, Joyce, the misunderstanding you had is quite natural, actually. Even I thought, uh, up to a certain point, maybe we are going to show the whole film. Um, I realized that time zone-wise, that wouldn't work. Uh, you know, usually, whether our own films or other people, definitely used to being in the same room watching the film, picking up each other's energies. You know, I mean, I always am influenced by people laughing at places that I might not find funny. And then I wonder what um, they found funny in that part. And also, of course, if it's in a language other than English, whoever speaks that language might be watching a very different films of us reading the English subtitles. Um, in fact, when I was re-watching Ghore Baire yesterday, I was struck by how many of the English subtitles I don't agree with. Um, and for some of them, I was thinking, oh, that's a wrong subtitle. And then for some of them, I was like, oh, maybe this is the subtitler trying to make it more subtle or more overt. Um, so in some cases, what's being said in Bengali is very different. Um, and the subtitles are making it less political or more political. It goes both ways. And so here, we've seen the film on our own time at different times. Some of us maybe with interruptions, because of course it's streaming and then we're coming together uh, to discuss the film, which, which, and in a disembodied situation here where we're seeing each other's faces across time zones. So it's, it's new for me. I'm also trying to figure out how to have that. Uh, the idea is I think I say a few words about the film, not in any sort of expert way, just as somebody who's followed Shatujit Rai my whole life, um, and then turn over the discussion to each of you. Um, there's a little device, which I actually didn't even know about, which is that if you click on participants and the window you get on the right, there's a button called raise hand. And if you click on that, then a little hand will appear on top of your video. And that would make it easier perhaps so we can call on you. Um, and we know that some, if you have raised hand, then just keep your hand raised until we call on you. Um, I wanted to just, um, show two short clips from the film, if that's okay. Uh, just to sort of refresh our memory in case we saw it a little while back. And then for Joy, perhaps uh, it's a little extra as you haven't seen the whole film. Um, what I'm going to do is share screen and hopefully the audio is going to work as well. Um, uh, but before um, showing it, so when I share screen, Buthena, if I keep talking, will I still be heard? I'm not sure about that aspect or maybe Momo knows. Yes, uh, I can still be heard. Okay. 
Okay, because there's a few uh, screens that are just images and then I'll show two clips and I'll explain why I picked those two. Because the other thing is that I last saw this film 30 years ago as a young person. This is a film that was shown on national television in Bangladesh back in the days when there was just one TV channel, no satellite. So whatever was on television, the whole country or the part that had televisions watched together. And we didn't, they wouldn't show Indian films because Indian films were considered a threat to Bangladeshi films. And they made the rare exception for films like this that were considered somehow, you know, beyond the country. Um, and ironic or appropriate since the film is partially about the nation of India uh, at the departure of British rule. And when I saw it 30 years ago, I just saw it as, oh, the great man, Sutajit Rai, this is his film. And it's one of the first films by him that I saw that were in color. Um, I didn't read any of the things that I saw when I watched it uh, this week, where, you know, parts of it, of course, there's a deeply conservative message. Um, you know, we can get into all of that. Um, and then there are also the other things that can be said about Sutajit Rai himself. And this position of what I would call the... Uh, person from the Hindu community who always uh, mourns partition of India, but part of the mourning always includes this line of, oh, Hindus and Muslims, there was no issue until the British came, which of course, a great deal of scholarly research has shown is not true. And the denial of this is also part of the problem. And that shows up in this film as well. Um, so I'm just going to share screen and then switch to the uh, keynote and hopefully this will work. So this is just from the movie screen. And in the US, actually, it's only out of, um, you can't watch it time zone. So we had to do a little bit of uh, Buthena a screener. But for a lot of you, it's still on movie. Um, and I just wanted to focus on this idea of noblesse oblige, because the key character, of course, is a landlord who's benevolent towards Muslim peasants, benevolent to give out. And he always talks about how everything was fine before. Um, and so it's like uh, Hindus and Muslims used to live together in peace. Uh, juxtaposed with the chant that you'll hear throughout the film, Bande Mataram, which is one of the chants um, of the independence movement. But there is a great deal of scholarship that shows that for parts of the Muslim community, this slogan wasn't actually um, so welcoming. Um, and there's a novel by Bonkim Chandro um, in which Bande Mataram is being chanted as the Muslim invaders are being attacked. Um, in a historical retelling, not of the partition period, uh, uh, but uh, pre-British Indian history. So there's a whole history to this chant and it being shown as the entire movement is complicated for certainly for Muslim community. Muslim scholars have talked about this. And a few years ago, there was actually a little controversy about A.R. Rahman using Bande Mataram uh, in one of his film songs um, in the same context. And so, of course, he's the noble uh, landlord who is kindly towards his tenants and only cares about them. Um, and then his advisor tells him that the Muslim preachers are coming from Dhaka uh, to stir up uh, anti-Hindu sentiments. And then he says, oh, but think about how we ourselves treated the poor Muslim. People can see this, right? Just me. Yeah. Um, and then his battle with the liberation leader is that he really fomenting more trouble, whereas the landlord uh, wants to keep things as they were, which also includes of Muslims as um, his tenants. And then towards then he comes, of course, he's dressed um, also as a British Saab across a Muslim preacher um, talking to his um, followers outside the mosque. By the grace of Islam, Allah, Muslims are the majority in Bengal. And this Muslim majority was also part of the fear factor um, for at least certainly the Hindu elite. That was one of the subterranean strands that led to the partition of this film. And Tagore himself are completely silent about. And then, of course, when the, you know, you never see any rioting Hindu community uh, people. You only see rioting Muslims. And, of course, they're chanting Allah is great. Um, and I'm just going to show a short clip from, this is the second speech the revolutionary gives. The first one he's giving to his followers. The second one he's actually trying to appeal to uh, Muslim peasants. <laughs> এই দেওয়াল সরাসরি ভেঙে ফেলবার অধিকার সরকার আমাদের দেননি কিন্তু সরকারকে জব্দ করব বলে 
আমরা অন্য রাস্তা নিয়েছি একটা প্রধান রাস্তা হলো আমাদের হাটে বাজারে বিদেশি জিনিসের কেনা বেচা বন্ধ করা নুন চিনি কাপড় সাবান আমাদের দৈনিক ব্যবহারের নানান জিনিস আজকাল বাজারে বিদেশি ছাড়া পাওয়া যায় না এই সব জিনিস বিক্রির ফলে বিদেশি সরকার আমাদের দেশ থেকে দুহাতে উঠে নিয়ে যাচ্ছেন ফলে আমাদের দেশের দারিদ্র ক্রমাগত বেড়েই চলেছে এটা অন্যায় এটা চুরু এতদিন আমরা এটা মেনে এসেছি কিন্তু আর মানবো না আমি জানি যে বিদেশি জিনিসের বদলে দেশি জিনিস পাওয়া যায় না তাই বাধ্য হয়ে তোমরা বিদেশি জিনিস কিন্তু কটা দিন যদি আমরা একটু কষ্ট করতে রাজি থাকি আর সেই সঙ্গে দেশি জিনিস উৎপাদনের করি তাহলে কিছুদিনের মধ্যেই আর আমাদের কোনো কষ্ট থাকবে না ভাই সব তোমাদের মুখের দিকে আমরা আজ তাকিয়ে আছি তোমরা যদি এ ব্যাপারে এগিয়ে আসো তাহলে বাংলা ভাগ করার কলঙ্ক দূর হয় আবার আমরা মাথা তুলে দাঁড়াতে পারি এইবার দেখো তোমরা এই গন্ডি দেখছো এর মধ্যে আমাদের যার কাছে যা বিলিতি জিনিস আছে বিদেশি জায়গায় দেশি জিনিস তৈরি করার ব্যবস্থা হচ্ছে অনেক ধনী ব্যবসাদার এ ব্যাপারে তোমরা কেবল রোজগারের পর বন্ধ হয়ে যাচ্ছে যে লোকসান কাল আর তা লোকসান থাকবে না তাই বলছি এই গন্ডির মধ্যে ফেলো তোমাদের যে মাটিতে তোমরা মানুষ হয়েছ যে দেশকে তোমরা ভালোবাসো সেই দেশের কাজে তোমরা এগিয়ে বিদেশি মিলের কাপড় বিদেশি মিলের সুতো বিদেশি কারখানা চিনি বিদেশি নুন বিদেশি ছুরি বিদেশি সেলাই বিদেশি যা কিছু বিদেশি যা কিছু সব ফেলে দাও ওই গন্ডির মধ্যে তোমাদের হাত জোর করে বলছি তোমরা বসে থেকো না এগিয়ে এসে স্বদেশির কাজে সাহায্য করো তোমাদের মহারাজ আমার বন্ধু আমি তারই বাড়িতে অতীত হয়ে রয়েছি তাই তোমাদের বোঝা উচিত যে ব্যাপারে তার মত আছে আমরা মাল মিলতে চাই বেঁচে খামতি বেশি মাল আমরা দোকানে রাখতে যাইতেছি আমরা <laughs> The other thing that I just wanted to briefly talk about uh, before ending the uh, clips is this uh, you know, idea of the family home as a metaphor for the nation and where all of these things play out, you know, starting, of course, with uh, the Opu trilogy, uh, which established Shotojit Rai. Uh, and there's this, um, of course, quite retrograde idea of the woman's role in the family. Uh, and also this conversation about adultery that runs through uh, multiple films of his it wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that the landlord uh, the other character which is played by victor banerjee the man with the mustache um is you know there's some uh, autobiographical overlap between both the author rabindranath tagore who came from a elite landowning family and shotojit rai himself and so there's something of that in there and what i was struck by when i was watching this is this this motif of the family home spoiled which shows up in one of his other earlier films as well which is charulata which is also based on a tagore novel Uh, so I'll just quickly show a clip from towards the end of Gore Baide and then show you a clip from Charu Lotta, which is a 1964 black and white film in which this idea of the home being spoiled by the outsider, more glamorous and cosmopolitan man of letters who ruins the stable family home. 
uh, repeats. So this is from Ghore Baire. And this is when they've reconciled finally. She's come back to him, learned her mistake. And then contrast that with the Arul Lata film from 64, which is based on another Rabindranath Tagore um, story called Nostonir. Nostonir translates to spoiled nest, which can be both bird nest and home, um, which again has Shomitra Chattopadhyay in it. Um, and in this film, the bored wife of the affluent uh, man uh, has an affair with a much more sophisticated book reading outsider. And at the end, she returns to him and he has, because she's been spurned by that character and he's also willing to take her. Just watch this last scene. So I just did the share. We're back together, right? In one screen. Okay. 
All right. Um, that was my first time doing that share screen thing. Other people are probably veterans, so I wasn't 100% sure if it was going to work. Uh, you know, I get chills when I see, I know we're not supposed to be discussing Charulota, uh, but I get chills when I see that scene. I, I was also young when I first saw that film, but that one I've seen many more times. I like it much more than um, Charulota is one of his classics. Um, it's also, to be fair, to Shotujitra in 1964 when he's at the peak of his um, filmmaking career. You know, it's about less than a decade after the Opu trilogy triumph um, globally. Where he is, is 1984, it's towards the end of his life. He makes three more films after this, none of which I really like that much, but it's also unfair to say that to him perhaps because he's, you know, he's old at that point and perhaps struggling uh, to finish the films. Um, and in some ways, um, maybe this can be said of many, but definitely of him, his black and white films, the way he worked with black and white is just of a whole other uh, tone. Um, but also that last scene of Charulata after he freezes the scene um, and just lets it turn into a still photo, just the way that scene is staged. I just um, am working on a film right now, which is shot in Kolkata in a building with a similar balcony area. And while we were filming, we didn't think of Charulata at all, actually. We just filmed. And then last night when I was watching Charulata and Ghore Bairi realized that unconsciously, we've all, all of us working on this new film have channeled Shatajit, the framing and everything. Um, but also, of course, I mean, one of the things I kept thinking when I watched Ghore Bairi is that in all sorts of ways, um, you know, I of course found it a quite retrograde message of the film, both about um, uh, the politics of partition, whether Hindu Muslims were united before the British arrived, um, and also of course the position of the family home, the family unit, the position of women within that. Uh, but I don't want to prejudge too much, and I also want to keep the factor of time, the time of the making of the film versus the conversation. Um, so those were my opening remarks that I had quasi prepared. I think now the idea is to turn over the discussion to all of you um, with any of your thoughts. Um, if you are able to use the raise hand thing, great. Or if not, you can just put up your hand and um, we can do it that way. Um, whoever wants to have the first go at anything that you thought of when you saw the film. Um, and I can talk more about the things I talked about as the hidden politics of the film, but I'd like to hear from others first. Anjali, you have a raised hand, I believe. Sure, yeah. I just had a question for you, Naeem, and for anyone else who knows much about this film. Um, you know, I grew up in India and I heard so much about this film. It came out when I was very young, um, but I sort of watched it at some point and everybody was talking about it, you know, and like you, Naeem, it was just like this mask, you know, another film by the great master. Um, it was really interesting to watch bits of it today again, but I was curious if you can kind of situate it a little bit for us, um, how much of the politics of the film is Tagore's, you know, writing this in 1916, and how much of it is um, Satyajit Rai's writing it, I guess in the 40s, but then actually making it in, in the late, in the, in the mid 80s, or early 80s, right? And just where the politics and thinking around um, particularly, you know, you know, by 1980, early 1980s, Vande Matram was like, you know, it, <laughs> it had already taken on communal overtones very strongly, right? Um, and that was in a different way than perhaps in 1916 was like widely known. Um, so I'm just wondering if you can kind of historicize the film a little bit and between um, Satyajit Rai and Tagore um, and the writing of the film, the, the screenplay, and then the actual making of it. Thank you. It's, it's a great question. I definitely can't do justice to the call, uh, but I can say a few things. Um, and for those interested, Andrew Robinson's uh, biography of Satyajit Rai may be a good place to start. Uh, and there's another book. Uh, that I'll include the reference of towards the end. I mean, to start off, of course, the politics is first and foremost Tagore. Um, and it's it's complicated to analyze Tagore's politics because you always have to think of what would have happened to his politics if he had lived longer and seen 
the wound of partition, would his politics have changed? I mean, same thing is sometimes said about Gandhi as well. Um, one story that I always used to hear is that Gandhi was about to do the peace march to Pakistan when he was assassinated. Whether that's true or urban legend, whether he was going to do it or not, what would have been the impact, we'll never know. Same thing with Tagore. Uh, he died even earlier. He died before the partition actually took place, before 47. So Tagore's politics definitely re reflects the Hindu elite of the 1920s and 30s for sure. And it's been said about Tagore that the person who is considered the, one of the greatest writers of Bengal, um, certainly the most acclaimed, and the person who spawned multiple forms, right? Novel, short stories, um, songs, all of the forms that have the uh, adjective Rabindrik attached to it. Um, you know, Muslims are almost invisible. They are just non-entities in all his work. Um, unless they show up as the figure of the backward, obscurantist uh, preacher or uh, the person cloaked with superstition. And even in this film, there's a bit of dialogue. I don't know if that was in Tagore or uh, Ray's edition. I suspect it was Tagore, where the explanation for why women are in the Andar Mahal is put down to, well, we didn't used to do this before the Muslims came. And, you know, it's just one or two sentences of dialogue and then move on. But that's actually enough within the film form to further um, reinforce what's actually a quite uh, dangerous politics uh, in India back then and even now, which is that forces of darkness came with the Muslims as the invaders with their alien forms. So that's definitely in Tagore's politics. There's a lot of good scholarship in Bengali about uh, Muslim depictions in Tagore, uh, which haven't been translated, Ahmad Safa. Bengali intellectual, he's written about this. Uh, Muhammad Azam has re recently written a book in which this topic also comes up. It'd be great to get that translated at some point. Um, the most kind evaluation of Tagore usually is that uh, Muslim characters suffer by the sin of omission. They're just invisible. They're not talked about. Even though he's writing about Bengal, and it's only when he's talking about partition that Muslim characters uh, finally arrive. Um, with Rai, it's a more complicated thing because, um, you know, he perhaps felt he had to be faithful to Tagore, but it's also 1984, right, by the time he makes the film. So therefore, when I was watching it again, I have to say, when I first watched it on Bangladesh television, none of this occurred to me. I just was excited to see it. Now, when I looked at it, I was somewhat startled by some of the dialogue and some of the politics um, both gender and also, of course, vis-a-vis -vis the Muslims. And the thing is, by 1984, it takes a lot of um, at least ignoring, deliberately ignoring things to not understand what the significance of the saffron robe could be in 1984 India. Um, of course, maybe he made the film, was making the film a year before. Um, yeah, so if, you, if you're a Muslim audience watching it, you're reading those things and you're already seeing the roots of the future uh, politics of Islamophobia that's going to take root. So it's it's quite uh, startling to see that. At the same time, you know, I was thinking, okay, he was, you know, he was old by then. So perhaps, uh, you know, there's another film he made, Gono Shotru, which has an ending, which every time I've seen it makes me cringe because it's, it's just a really awful ending. And I always make the disclaimer of, oh, well, this was towards the end. So, you know, you, you're sort of thinking this thing of he's old, therefore he's not aware of what he's doing. But a political point of view, it's very, very problematic. But I think that whole, like, um, I think the Victor Banerjee character, the kindly tenant, you know, the most stash clean shaven person who very generously lets his wife leave Dandar Mahal, he's who both Shrotojit Rai and Tagore see themselves as, you know, that the enlightened Hindu elite uh, community person who never did anything communal, so why can't everybody else just get along? And never actually able to get inside a Muslim subjectivity. The only way Muslims show up in Ghore Baire is the uh, the, the peasants who are in the market who refuse and who speak in a more, um, you know, dialectical Bangla, which also to my ears felt slightly wrong, but perhaps not. Uh, and then there are the mob that's yelling Allahu Akbar and setting things on fire. That's their appearances. And, uh, you know, so they're always angry. They're not, they don't have any inner life. Um, so that's what I'll say. I also perhaps sounding more critical than I want to be. Um, I also want to... I always argue this to see Tagore within his time and Ray within his time, a product of a certain time. So there can be other evaluations as well. Oh, uh, Manjura Man has, yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Sorry, I mispronounced your name. Apologies. 
Um, you have to unmute yourself. You're muted. Or the admin can unmute you. Yeah. Am I audible now? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Okay, what I liked was the way uh, patriarchy is happily subverted in this entire scheme of things. Uh, like you said, that you'd have liked to see uh, the filmmaker as well as the writer, the Tagore as well as Rai, also reflect their times. The point is, this is a very ideal, this is what they would want in, that's the change they were seeking, which is why they portrayed this world of men being so supportive of women choices, largely. So I found that very interesting and very progressive. And at a time when they set it, um, is it still believable when we go back and say this could have happened or is it's just a story? How do you, how do you on hindsight, look at it? Because uh, placing it in context and placing it in the whole idea of patriarchy, this seems to be a little in the believable, not believable space. So how do you see it? Yeah, excellent, excellent point. Yeah, um, and also to be uh, fair to Ray, there are uh, working women in some of his films in the 50s and 60s at a time when having that in Ray's films had a big impact on uh, Indian national psyche, certainly. Mm -hmm. So not all his films had women just struggling to just only leave the home. Mm -hmm. uh, this one does. We, uh, Zam, I believe. Okay, a uh, couple of things I have noticed in this movie. One thing is that it uh, exposes the hypocrisy of that Sodeshi moment, especially, um, um, yeah, I I'm not sure whether Tagore was out of that Sodeshi moment when he wrote this novel. Uh, you can clarify on that. Uh, as you said, uh, Ray uh, produced and uh, made this film after surviving two heart attacks and all. I watched this movie a few years ago. Uh, another, uh, so this Swadeshi moment, it was, uh, you know, the moment uh, Bimala asked uh, Santip about the cigarettes. I mean, uh, it was foreign cigarettes. Okay. So that moment, so it, it, it's the first point where I realized, okay, so there's something wrong with Santip. And at the same time, uh, uh, you know, the Puritanism, which was, you know, be, being uh, uh, like Hail Motherland, whatever it is. So he tried this character of Sandeep, he tried to convey this. Uh, and then at, at the same time, uh, Satyajit Roy tried to expose this hypocrisy of Sandeep character. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I would like to hear from you as well. And the second thing, uh, uh, second point is uh, the patriarchy, internalizing the patriarchy by portraying the character of his sister-in-law that she, she didn't like uh, Bimala's freedom inside, uh, you know, in the house. So that character also, I mean, uh, I'm not sure. At the same time, uh, Nikhil is patronizing uh, the freedom of his wife and uh, the sister-in-law, uh, you know, he, it, it's shown as problematic with his uh, sister-in-law's character, with her sister-in-law's character. So I would like to hear from you about that part. Yeah, uh, I was actually, while you were talking, I just quickly looked some contextualize what was, what else happening when Tagore wrote this. So Tagore wrote in 1916, uh, which just to pick milestones is three years after he wins the Nobel Prize. So he has new stature as the voice of India to the world. Um, first Indian writer to prize in literature. Um, it's also um, six year, um, it's, uh, it's six years after the end of the partition of the first partition of Bengal. So just in case people don't know this, Bengal was partitioned twice in 1905 um, as a test. Uh, and then 1910, the partition was reversed mainly because primarily from the uh, Bengali Hindu elite and political class or that the partition was actually severely reducing their power. The result of that first part of those five years is that, of course, the Muslim elite Perhaps not the Muslim peasant, but the Muslim elite certainly sees that partition might be for some of them better because they can be leaders of a smaller divided province, i.e. East Bengal. So the first partition of Bengal both creates um, fear in uh, Bengali Hindu political class and the Bengali Muslim political class. 
Uh, so Tagore is writing six years after that context. So it's clear that that's one of the things. Uh, the other thing that I had to look up, um, and it was afterwards, is the Chori Chaura incident, which is the quite well-known incident where a police um, station is attacked and uh, police officers are killed by people following Gandhi's Chaudeshi movement. And Gandhi basically after that shuts down the movement to the shock of a lot of his uh, leadership in protest against that movement. And for those who've seen uh, Richard Attenborough's Gandhi, which is kind of Indian partition in simplified form, but it does pick up some of the highlights. The Chori Chaura incident uh, is of course included, uh, but there's a very good book about it also by Shahid Amin, which is worth reading. And so Chori Chaura shows that the Gandhian disciples can also turn to violence, right? Um, whether Shadeshi or uh, whether Shadeshi is the reason or not. So I think those fears within the elite is also circulating quite strongly um, in this film. Shadeshi is shown um, with no redemption actually, right? I mean, it's conniving, it's manipulating, the peasants refuse. So they say, okay, we're going to set things on fire, force them to do it. Uh, you know, there's secret arms smuggling, et cetera, going on. Um, so it, I think Tagore's politics are pretty clear. Uh, he's also writing in the moment, perhaps hoping to influence events, which Ray, of course, is not. Uh, by the time he's made it, it's the time of looking back. Um, and again, I think relevant that it comes out after Gandhi, although, of course, I'm sure he's working on it already. Um, about the um, second question, I, I mean, I think I'll defer to others on that one. Um, but it's clear that all the characters kind of archetype and the sister-in-law is you know practically uh you know like like a character from macbeth in her glee at the fall um and i have to say if you watched it with english subtitles this is one part where the subtitles don't do justice the bangla is so much more i would say wicked um and the way she says certain things just a word but it's quite evil in its incantation and the english is quite uh mono um, at some point, I actually I thought of actually making a list of what I would consider mistranslations or translations that simplify in this film, but uh, ran out of time. And we have George. Yes, uh, I, would, I would like to say something uh, about my opinion a bit. So, uh, for me, the, the, the most powerful uh, thing about the directive is uh, that uh, I did watch a piece of theater, actually, not a movie. And this is the power of the movie, because all the scenes are almost in the same place. And there was no, not really visual effects and all of that. It's, it's about a story, and uh, I mean, you can go to a theater and it can be a piece of theater. So th this is one. The second, the story of the movie as well. Uh, we're all talking about India and the conflicts in India between Muslims, Hindus, and uh, and uh, how uh, the partition of Bengal, all of that. But I can relate it to my country as well. I come from Lebanon. It's the same what happened in my country and what's happening and will continue to happen forever and to other countries in the world as well. So the topic for me, the topic is universal, not only Indian, the topic. However, the story is in India, it happened in India, but it's universal, yeah, the topic. As well, uh, there was not only one topic for me, the, 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 I loved the topic of the women rights more than the political side of the movie as well. And uh, the purpose, uh, how on purpose the director as well, he chose not a beautiful woman as the wife of the Maharaja. If you look at her uh, directly, she, she's not a beautiful Indian girl, uh, I mean, married to a rich person. Uh, it, I believe that was on purpose, he did it on purpose. And, uh, and there's politics, there is vengeance, vengeance friendship, uh, women rights, uh, uh, too many topics in one movie. If we start now, maybe we will finish after three, four days uh, talking about this, all the topics he, he covered inside the movie. Uh, what else? <laughs> uh, so yeah, but, I mean, I did not watch other movies for the director to to judge on his uh, skills, but. Uh, from this movie, I can imagine uh, that uh, he's more into theater, in my opinion, which is really nice uh, to be in theater. 
and uh, the 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 uh, that's it. That's it. I will, it will come up in the discussions. Thank you for listening. Well, George, I would disagree with the first statement that I, I do think she's beautiful. Um, you might be influenced, however, by the last scene where she's gradually shown metamorphosing into a widow. And for those who've noticed, you'll notice that her hair gets really short in the last scene where she's covered in the white uh, sari that widows are supposed to wear. So that last scene might have left you with an impression. Um, but yeah. Um, you should definitely, all of, I mean, I'm sure many people have seen it, but definitely go back and see the black and white early work, especially the Opu trilogy, which is him at his peak form, the first three films that he makes uh, together, including the third one is the first arrival of Shomitra Chatterjee, who's the revolutionary in this film. If no hands come up, I'll start calling. Oh, there we go. Nairi, please go ahead. You can just yes, thank you. Uh, moving away a bit from the political and the social uh, aspects of the film, I wanted to get your opinion on the artistic value of the film. Um, one thing that I really enjoyed was the aesthetics, frankly. I thought there was, I don't know whether it was intentional or not, I thought, given that I'm not familiar with the works of the director, I thought maybe it was intentional to have so much, to put emphasis on the aesthetics, in the sense that although the film was filmed largely uh, indoors, so there's no scenery, it's, it's a bit more difficult to create beauty when it's indoors, still I thought there was really a lot of beauty. There was so much color. And for me, color is actually part of the Indian culture because it's a very colorful culture. And I wonder whether that was one of the factors. I wonder it was pure coincidence that there was this beauty, there was all this color indoors, or whether it was intentional. And it seemed to me that the filming indoors was both in a way very lively in terms of colors, but also it was very sober. And I thought that was amazing, actually. There's actually, I think, if I remember correctly, only two scenes that are outdoors, really. One is the one where he's in the market giving the speech. Uh, and the Muslim peasants finally said, no, we're not going to follow your movement. And the one is towards then where the land, where the ten landlord is on his horse. That's clearly outside when he happens across the Muslims listening to the speech outside the mosque. Other than that, everything is interior. I mean, to me, it's um, also very much a film about clothing, you know, from at the beginning, you know, he's... He's trying to encourage his wife and she's getting the training to be, a, you know, a Western woman, right? She should be dressing like an English woman. And there the Bengali really talks about that a lot. The subtitles flatten that a little bit. And then gradually there's the change, right? When she meets the revolutionary and she starts changing her clothing, still very Baroque. The saris she wears and the amount of jewelry she wears is a lot. And that, of course, perhaps is indicating her status uh, as the... As the um, elite wife, but um, the clothing changes. It becomes slightly more Sadeshi. Um, and of course, Sadeshi movement, among the many things it focused on, it focused on clothing above everything else. I mean, textiles were the bedrock of the trade between, um, or the, not the trade, the colonial extraction uh, from India. Uh, and of course, indigo, uh, the color and the dye is an iconic element within the conversations about what the British did to uh, forms of production. And of course, muslin is a form of clothing that has now, that disappeared uh, because the British considered it competition with British made clothing. And there's the iconic stories that uh, tailors, not tailors, sorry, the people who were the weavers had their thumbs cut off so that they could no longer make muslin, so that muslin as a form would die. That's a story that we were raised on as children, that the British are so cruel, they cut off the thumbs of our craftspeople. So clothing is very much part of it, right? And uh, one of the things you would always hear about the Sadeshi movement is they had to face the fact that if you're going to consume local clothing, you were going to consume clothing that was rough on, you know, rough to wear. Like um, Khabder is a rougher um, clothing. And so I think in this film, that's also there, the clothing starts changing. And then of course, towards the end, um, 
when he's on the horse, he's dressed completely like a British gentleman. So I think the color that we see is also the color of the clothing that is like very, I think what he spent a great deal of planning time on in this film. Um, I have to say I'm partial to black and white, especially when I went back and watched Charulota. And it's interesting in Charulota, in the, she doesn't dress like that the whole time, but Madhavi Mukherjee, the wife, uh, the actress who plays the wife, uh, in the last scene, the blouse she's wearing is a very particular kind of blouse, which is sort of a melange of various styles, but definitely also influenced by what people thought were the European styles. So it's like a mixture. That's in black and white, so you can't really see the colors of what she's wearing. Um, yeah, but it's a film about clothing as well. We have three people with their hands up. We have Anjali, Kazi, and George. So it's up to you now. Thank, thank you, Luz. Angelica. Well, very quickly, I was going to give Justin the chance. Um, I, would, I just wanted to respond to the sort of the comments about um, patriarchy and women and sort of women's emancipation. And I, you know, one of the things that this film sort of reminded me of is all the reading, <laughs> you know, I, I did in college and grad school around the sort of role of women in the Indian nationalist movement, right? And this investment in like the, you know, reforming society so that women can be seen as like this vessel of nationalism, but have to be, you know, appropriately strong and appropriately independent. Um, and there's a way in which, you know, that's brought out really well in the film, I thought that sort of sentiment, that investment, male, educated male investment in women's progress, <laughs> right? Which is different than a feminist movement, right? There's, there's, there is a real difference there in the sort of a investment in, emancipating women and a feminist movement and a liberatory movement versus, uh, you know, in order for us to be free as a society, our culture has to be more progressive. And for our culture to be progressive, we must educate women. So let us be, you know, kind and good to women and let us be um, generous <laughs> to women, but it all comes from men as opposed to, you know, coming from women and sort of being responsive to women's own demands and needs. So I just thought this film kind of exemplifies that nicely with, you know, this, this kind of a benevolent husband, right? Who's like, please come out into the open, you know, meet my friend while I, you know, suspect that you might be in love with him, <laughs> um, which is, a, you know, an interesting dynamic there. Well, he also actually says, I think at some point that he almost wants to subject her to the test. I think there's a, there's a bit of dialogue in Bangla very early on, which even suggests, you know, uh, you'll come back to me even after facing this very attractive man. I mean, he makes a reference to the fact that he has affairs. And another mistranslation, when he says not all of his lovers were Swadeshi, uh, they translate it wrong. What he means is they were uh, Western women, presumably English women. Uh, that's like a backdrop. The revolutionary not only smokes uh, Western cigarettes, he has affairs with uh, English women. I don't know if Anjali, whether Mother India was one of the films that was analyzed in these texts that you were reading. I mean, that's also what I thought about. Although, interestingly, uh, the revolutionary, the word he uses for her, his affectionate term for her, uh, also slightly mistranslated. He first calls her Mokhi Rani, Queen of the Bees, and then he shortens it to Mokhi, which actually made me, uh, uh, I mean, it's that's like the early intimation of the sexual dynamic because Mukhi is very, very flirtatious and has all sorts of other connotations as well. Um, uh, but also has the idea of the productive uh, queen of the herd and both men and women will hear your call. Um, Jessin, you had your hand, hand up. Uh, you have to unmute yourself. Yes. Can you hear me now? Okay. So, Discussing about a movie in front of movie experts is not a very good idea. While We're watching the movie, <laughs> while watching the movie, I was just thinking that um, why the nationalist movement evolved. Um, there was a school of thought. They believed that Muslims did not support that movement. Why was that? I just would like to listen your opinions. You know, reading history is a very complicated thing. It depends on who wrote it. So I haven't found any uh, good historical book on this topic written by a Muslim. So um, I would like to listen to you. And uh, here, one, one more thing uh, I would like to say that um, history says that 
the landlords, not only the landlords, the Indians, especially the Hindu Indians that at that moment did not acknowledge uh, Muslims as Bengali. Uh, if I read one line from Sharad Chandra Chattopadhyay, I have to recall it, it was like this, that the Muslims and the Bengalis are playing football in the afternoon. From so, Sikanto, yeah, it's a famous, famous line yeah. where, he, where the exact translation would be, football game is going on, on one yeah. side are Bengalis, on the other side are Muslims. But Muslim. they're both Bengali, but the Muslims yeah, yeah. are not no, yes, yes. So that's the thing. And uh, some says that the landlords, Hindu landlords, they did, didn't want to actually, um, and others, they didn't want the partition, they didn't support the partition as because they didn't want another city to rise, another capital to rise, and they didn't just share their, you know, jamindaris. So what do you think about it? I'd have to listen to your views. Jessina, I also wanted to ask you, um, did you see this film first on Bangladesh television or no, did you see no. it on video? Okay, you didn't see it on television. Because I remember watching it, you know, and thinking... Yeah, I, I have yeah. seen it, I think, uh, 10 to 12 years, 15 years ago, maybe. And while I was watching it again, uh, day before yesterday, I was thinking it's almost, it's so relevant today, even today. It's the same riots, yeah. you know, the same Hindu-Muslim clashes and the same fights, the forced fight with the foreign products are still there, so... No. There are so many there, things to... Yeah. There's a great uh, contemporary film. I mean, it's a commercial film, but I really yeah. like recommending it, which sort of repeats this point about uh, the same issues are going on, uh, which is a film called Hey Ram um, with Kamal Hassan. And Hey Ram has this sequence where, of course, most of it is during the partition riots. And then it does a flash forward to contemporary riots that are happening. And the protagonist is I'm kind of giving it away. is in the ambulance. And I think he says something like, wake me up, because he thinks he's dreaming about the 1940s, but he's sitting yeah. in, I think, 1984, maybe. Um, those right. I mean, two books I would recommend, because impossible to summarize that here, um, is two good books to read about partition, which shows, so, which starts showing Muslim subjectivity. I think they should be read together. Uh, one is Joya Chatterjee's book, Bengal Divided, um, which is yeah. out of print, but- Yeah, that's what I already read, yes. Right, so that, that one, I'm, I'm also saying it for, for the others on the uh, discussion. Um, that one's a good book to read just to understand how out of touch uh, Bengali Hindu elite subjectivity was and how frightened it was at the idea of Muslim empowerment. Because again, the film has that line spoken by a Muslim, but was part of Hindu fear, which is the demographic majority, uh, the, the demographic advantage of Muslims, you know, which is also related to the idea of whether Muslims are more fertile, whether they're having more children, et cetera, et cetera. And there were pamphlets about this as well. Um, so demographic anxiety, power anxiety, she talks about all of that. And she really looks at the Bengali Hindu elite, but shows how it created the conditions that made partition possible. And the other one, um, which I really like is Aisha Jalal's book, The Soul Spokesman, which is about Zinna, but talks about how, um, you know, at a certain point, perhaps demands for a separate homeland appeared to be the only possible choice. Although, of course, gilded by the fact that Zinna also did want power and it was clear to him that power wasn't coming to him in undivided India. But the same truth also appeared to people on the Congress, Bengali, uh, sorry, not, not Bengali, Hindu leadership side, Vallabhai Patel and others. That's a whole sprawling, complicated politics. I mean, I think I get an allergic reaction these days when I see a film that has those dialogues about, well, we always coexisted and it's only the British because I think that's a fantasy. It's also a fantasy that I, my generation, we all, um, Jessin and I, I'm going to sing at age. So we, um, we were raised with these mythologies in school, right? Which also is conveniently assigns all responsibility to the British outsider. Everything was perfect until the British arrived. Certainly, of course, British colonialism um, accelerated everything um, and fine-tuned many of these things and made above ground what was subterranean. But that there was a nirvana of living together uh, is also a fantasy, as some of these books show. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, and I think one more, I guess, and one more thing is the Nikhilesh in this movie is, I you know, it's the landlord, the reflection of Tagore, right? And Tagore definitely Tagore's unity-seeking aesthetics that is influenced by you know Western liberalism is very much reflected in the movie. What I was thinking is that Tagore is an anti-nationalitarian. 
but three nation states choose their national anthem from Tagore's creation. Why was that? What do you think about it? Well, I think maybe everyone can consider that. Uh, but Jason, you might want to explain the three nation comment. Um, three nation state is India, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka. Right. Yep. Take Tagore as, as their yeah. core. So we know that he wrote uh, several poems on motherland, like, you know, Wamar Desher Mateo, my motherland, I bow to thee, and like this. But were those poems written on patriotism or on based on nationalism as a question? Because we know that he, he was against the uh, nationalist idea. Hmm. He was a global cosmopolitan, um, <laughs> as new new writing is showing. Um, I want to make sure that others also get a, there's three hands up. I'm not sure who put their hands up first. Nizam, Shehab, and George have their hand up. Perhaps um, Shehab, if you want to go. Happy to. Um, to second a little bit what was just said, I do think some of the themes are, they felt quite timely. Um, you know, this idea of uh, self-sufficiency versus uh, globalism or... Uh, populists using, uh, you know, ethnicity or religion um, and, uh, you know, charismatic uh, oratory skills and, uh, and, and these great slogans. Um, and, of course, the ever-present difficulty of religions coexisting. Um, and uh, in my mind, you know, the, the good, um, in this case, being the globalists versus the bad, the localist, you know, to me, that has it completely the wrong way around. And I, if anything, this moment is, uh, is maybe um, showing us a little bit of that, that fallacy of, uh, of that, that, that globalist uh, ideal of these, uh, these, these integrated economies and so on. But, um, and I also, I actually really disliked Nikhil. Um, I <laughs> just represented a lot of uh, what really turns me off about liberal culture, I think, the kind of pushover, light, cosmopolitan, um, this Western pragmatic, uh, sincere but patronizing care for the poor and the women, um, the complete absence of passion and, and action, uh, this kind of weak, cuckold husband. So... It's, it's interesting. I just, I found myself um, not really having much time for him and really gravitating towards Sandeep. Clearly he evoked strong emotions in you. Yeah. Um, who else? Nizam, you're muted. You have to unmute yourself. All right. Uh, there is one more thing. Uh, I mean, apart from the uh, women portrayal, I would like to ask about the portrayal of uh, lower caste people, uh, especially the servants in the house. Uh, you can see the people, how they were dressed and everything. So that clearly gives us the idea about the lower caste. And the family, I um, mean, Nikhil and family, they are obviously Savarna upper class elites, uh, upper class and upper caste elites, not only upper class. So, uh, uh, so that gives us an idea about why, I mean, the, these lower caste people, they are not part of any of this Sodeshi movement. And in fact, this Sodeshi movement uh, somehow affects their, like, uh, I mean, their lives. I mean, uh, that's been said in one time. And another thing about when we were talking about the national anthem, I, I, I was in, uh, I, I didn't hear it quite. The national anthem uh, was written in appraisal of a viceroy. If I, you know, we had the recent controversies, I mean, like. You're talking about second. Jonagona Monk, right? Yes, 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 yes. Right. But uh, the Bangladesh one is different. But yeah, go ahead. Okay. It's so, Amar Shonar Bangladesh, Bangladesh. But continue, please. Okay, so uh, regarding this national anthem of India, Janakanamana, so we had some controversies like two, year, two, three years ago where some of my, some of our friends were arrested for not standing up while the Janakanamana was, uh, you know, recited before a movie started. I mean, it was mandatory uh, back then that Janakanamana has to be recited before a movie 
starts in a theater, which is very awkward. And uh, somewhere charged with sedition uh, back home uh, when they didn't stand up. So uh, later on, the high court, I mean, the court removed this, I mean, uh, law. I mean, it, it, was, it, it made voluntary, not mandatory. So just adding, since you talked about that national anthem thing, and national anthem was written, uh, will return this one in order to apprise, I mean, as a apprise to the viceroy or something. I don't, I don't remember. I've read it long ago, but something uh, like that. That's it. I would like to hear that uh, cast point of you from you. Who wants to take up the cast point? A long silence. I had the same question. It's just like, you know, if Muslims are invisible, you know, people who are non sovereign Hindus are barely even seen. <laughs> Like they're not yeah. angry, there's nothing. There's just, they're like, you know, completely abject. <laughs> yeah, there's not even the position of the house help, which you usually see in these films on the edge. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, there's layers upon layers. There's the Muslim lament about their invisibility in literature coming out of this period. And then there's the subaltern lament about even more invisibility, perhaps, because at least the Muslims appear as foils in some of these partition dramas. Anjali, you wanted to say something more? Or no? no You're I mean, muted. It just reminds me of like, um, I mean, I, it's a, it's a, it seems like off a piece with a lot of Bhadralok, kind of upper Bengali, Hindu, upper caste, uh, dominance of a cultural scene. <laughs> that is not very self-aware, to put it mildly, of, mm -hmm. their, uh, of them not being the, you know, the entirety of Bengalis <laughs> and not representing all of Bengali culture, but assuming that they are the pinnacle of Bengali culture um, mm -hmm. and taking on that mantle without a self-awareness of the privilege, which is not to say everybody, obviously there are wonderful historians and artists and scholars who are challenging this in different ways, but, um, you know, for a long time in mainstream culture. That seems to have been the case. And I'd, I'd love your thoughts, Naeem and Jessen and other uh, folks who understand Banga culture better. So. I mean, there's, sorry, Jessen, go ahead. You wanted to say something. I can't tell actually if people are leaning forward to unmute or not. So I'm just guessing as to who wants to speak. I didn't raise hand, but still I would like to take the opportunity. The thing is that uh, secularism and socialism, the clause were added to the constitution, Indian constitution in 1976, so far I remember. But where is the secularism? And how this riot will get end? The BJP is coming to the power, you know, as a religious based, religion based party when the constitution holds that it's a secular country. Isn't it very unconstitutional? So the people are voting BJP and people are choosing to go against to their constitution. It's a very complicated thing. So what is the future of India? is nation state but idea of nationalism has failed. You know, I was reading Ashish Nandi, he said that idea of nationalism has failed as well as, and the socialism, uh, secularism has also failed. So uh, I don't know, then in that case, maybe they have uh, the close the Republic, but they didn't practice the right, the Republic idea properly. And even the, the right, if we think about Europe, that they are the, country who were national state, but in 1956, perhaps the 47 countries together on anonymous, they decided to, you know, run their country on right-based thoughts. So these are the, some thoughts and this question that um, what will happen to India and how the, how uh, unjust society of, you know, will get and that's it. And, uh, and the education okay. system, you know, the uh, Tagore, Tagore emphasized on social reform. And Tagore 
he is emphasizing on social reform and he is loving other Western culture. How is this possible? A society, they have to love their history, their thing to get a, you know, if they believe in nation state to develop a, a proper nationalism, to get the proper nationalism thing, right? But, you know, ruining their own history, how they would achieve this, you know, that that is the dream to get. So is Ashish Nandar right that the nationalistic idea has failed in India? And also the secularism, just a question. Thank you, Jasin. Uh, Manju Ramanan, you had your hand up. You have to unmute. You're muted. There we go. Thank you. Right. Uh, so there are two things there. We go back saying that let us look at people. It could be Tagore, it could be Satyajit Rai. They were men of their times. They were not idealized products where you have feminism in place, you have casteism in place. Everything is correct about them. They, they had their flaws and they tried in their uh, climate of things to be as progressive as they could be. So uh, instead of, I mean, there would be lapses. There is, again, when we're talking about classes, there, there was no, uh, I mean, they're about Muslims or about, uh, you know, casteism. And we say the lower caste, the, we shouldn't even say lower caste. The caste that were considered to be lower are not uh, visible or they're not, they do not have a voice of their own. So to be kind, to be compassionate about, you know, when I look at Gandhi too, a lot of it was at one point in time, uh, he considered prostitution to be a crime. So do you judge him for that? Saying that because he was a man of his times as well. There were many other things about a leader that we too much idealize it too much. The problem with us as today's uh, thinkers are we go back and say maybe they, they had these flaws. But if you look at them as, think, as people who are struggling to establish some progressive outlooks within their purviews, well, they moved things ahead to what they could move ahead. Another thing about secularism and what about, and spoke about, uh, uh, this is about Kazi Jasin, who spoke about the future of India. Uh, well, I have reported the riots of 2002 in Gujarat. I've reported the riots. I was a journalist during the riots. The first pictures of Godhra came from my office. So I have seen my city from, uh, I'm from Gujarat. I was raised in Gujarat, though I'm a South Indian. Uh, so Baroda, the city that I'm from, where the riots happened, Godhra riots, Godhra is very close to Baroda. The first pictures of the riots came from my office in the Times of India. My photographer went and clicked those pictures and came back to us. My city, which is called the cultural city, it's called the Sanskar Nagri. If you look at Baroda, which is uh, very close to Ahmedabad, everything about that city was progressive till the time I remember, like we all idealize our past. So as far as I go back and idealize my past, quite a lot of it was progressive because it had a Maratha rule, we had uh, uh, a king at one point in time was very progressive, Maharaja Sajirao Gaikwad. Uh, there were women clubs in Baroda in, uh, dating back to 1901. Yoshi Aurobindo, who used to live in Baroda and used to be the principal of the Baroda College for 14 years, took part in the freedom movement and was employed by the, uh, by the Ram Maharaja of Baroda. So we have seen a lot of progressive uh, outlooks at one point in time. Cut to 2002, and my city is in flames. And everything, and uh, everything about it is always about uh, you know there is there is a bit of a discordant relationship between uh, two communities that we are talking about. But then, if we keep and today, a lot of the world, not just India, this we're moving towards a very totalitarian kind of a space, mind space. You either fall in queue. And if you do not agree or accept, uh, well, intellectual debate or intellectual uh, discussion is not encouraged. Uh, the intellectuals have been killed. There have been places across the world, I'm sure, they've been just exterminated because they thought and they protested. We've had journalists being shot dead in India. So, uh, well, it is up to people like us, I think, thinkers who, pe who try to push the envelope, filmmakers, I think art, humor, uh, right now, that's what I see. There are two, three spaces through which you can actually speak about what you think 
rather than look at policy changes because uh, as I'm, I can talk about journalists, journalists for that matter, writers for that matter, uh, work under censorship to a large extent. We do. Either your, the advertising department gives you a censorship or, you, your, or your own, uh, uh, you know, mm, there's a state which it doesn't, ask, doesn't allow you to do certain things. So within spaces, I think revolution is possible. And uh, that's why we need to be pushing that. I cannot talk about I mean, I'm not very well versed to talk about policy and uh, politics, but on an individual level, if we keep reminding ourselves of our secularity, um, the fact that not just India is secular, uh, I think it's a very progressive outlook to think secular, largely. I mean, not just one, one country, one state. If we keep that in our head, I think we can increase our breed, <laughs> is what I could say. And maybe, I don't know whether that's an answer at all, but this is an observation. So. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have to say the film that was chosen um, has led us down a certain path of discussion inevitably. Uh, you know, when, when Butena first contacted me and said the film to be discussed is Ghore Baire, uh, I remember wondering if, because Ghore Baire is also about, you know, leaving the isolation of home, whether it had been selected as some sort of commentary on uh, the experience of being fined. Uh, and then when I watched it and reminded myself what the film was about, my mind, of course, went towards the partition narrative. And of course, now in our discussion, inevitably, that's kind of dominant. It's interesting to reflect also the fact that if a different Ray film had been chosen, we might have spent a lot more time talking about his use of shadow and, uh, you, you know, positioning and all that. I mean, some of his other, a lot of his other films, of course, especially I think the black and white ones, there's a particular kind of classical framing that to me is absent in this one, right? I mean, um, I think Nairi mentioned uh, and some of the people mentioned that they found this film beautiful and in some ways it is, but to me, um, I'm less enamored of the aesthetics of this film and therefore my mind turns more towards the politics, which are of course the backdrop of this film, but a different Ray film would have had us talking about something completely different. Um, not even just Toku trilogy, but many of the films that came afterwards. Um, I don't know how we're doing on time, but I see there are two more hands up, George and Badi. So I don't know if George, if you still wanted to say something. Um, yes. Uh, so, uh, okay. In the, the late uh, 18th uh, century, the, the, there was, I mean, the anarchists in Europe and uh, la bourgeoisie. So, in terms of women rights, the anarchists were fighting for the women rights. So anarchists, which were the poorest, and the bourgeoisie were, were like uh, dominating the women at home. Uh, in this movie uh, that we watch, it's the somehow the opposite. Like the revolution, we were lacking women, and the Maharaja is the one who were giving the freedom to the women. What is this link? I did not really uh, link it. Why the director insisted that the freedom of the Indian woman came from the Maharaja, not the vice versa from the nationalism, the, the, the revolution? Well, actually, it doesn't come from either, right? I mean, he has this uh, way of giving freedom to his wife as some sort of test and eventually she returns to him and then the revolutionary of course betrays the woman so i mean both of them are incredibly flawed but if you want to talk about the original novel the novel definitely was frightened of the possibility for violence from the revolutionary movement that's clear i mean the revolutionaries the leader or the follower they're never shown taking up really arms against the british i mean there are all sorts of moments in the anti-british movement such as the chittagong armory raid about which there's a recent film, which you could show as the kind of type of violence that people are okay with in the, in the sense that it's understood in any revolutionary discourse that violence against the oppressive colonizing power is the one that we understand as legitimate. I mean, whichever discourse, depends on which discourse you're in. And that's not really in this film, except for the English school teacher getting her head smashed by a rock by some school kids who the presumption is the school kids are too young to understand so the 
the anti-British movement is definitely shown as violent, uh, manipulative, conniving, and poisoning young minds. So it's not, it's not a kindly look at that movement, at least in the film. I really have to go back to the novel and reread it um, just to see what's in there in its detail. Um, yeah, uh, Badi, you had your hand up. I've been uh, uh, in enjoying listening to this discussion. In addition to the great insight that the movie provides, you know, about the historical context of, of, of this part of the world, the discussion as well provides a very rich, uh, you know, insights. Uh, and I, I thank you for this. Um, no doubt it's a movie about, for me, about layers. It's the movie of layers and symbols. So, you know, in terms of layers, you, you, we can, uh, go uh, indefinitely talking about you know the number of of issues that come into uh, play and that were brilliantly interwoven in in this movie from politics to religion to the uh, triangular relationship to the class uh, 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 difference uh, uh, to even the the ethical and unethical motives of the uh, characters and I think also it can be viewed from a symbolic perspective mostly. So you mentioned you were talking back to your point about costumes, for example, and I think you know costumes were played symbolically to to show the different uh, you know stages that that the wife went through. Also, the husband's position, which um, <laughs> uh, got on my nerve at, at times, you know, in its passivity and its uh, manipulation. And I thought, you know, on the intellectual level, on the symbolic level, it has a lot of of, of you know uh, uh, interpretation but it could come across as a little bit unreal at times, you know, especially in the situation when he went into uh, this, uh, to tell him he should leave and, and she was there and he ignored completely her presence there as if she, she wasn't there, she was standing by the window and he left. Definitely all of these were, were for me, were, were being played at the, at the very symbolic level and you know to convey messages and she, when she was back to him saying you know um, it's unforgivable what i've done and he said to her but you were in confinement for so many years don't forget this um you know as if he's the, the one who is you, you know understanding and uh, forgiving and and uh, which on a certain level seemed you know un unreal uh, from an emotional point of view yet it is on on the symbolic uh, point of view I have a, a, a question for you, since you were talking about the translation. Is the title translated into English an accurate one, at least, Home and, and the World? Um, yeah, that can be. I mean, Ghore Baire, I mean, Home and the World may even have been, because Tagore also translated some of his work, or at least referenced the English titles, may even have been one of the ones approved by him. Perhaps, I'm not sure. Ghore Baire as Home and the World is fine. I mean, Ghore is, you know, the home, Baire is outside. so. Um, that part is fine. It's often, um, I would say, what it is that the Bengali dialogue is, the, you talked about layer, the Bengali dialogue has more layers and the English sometimes simplifies it and perhaps simplifies it because they are thinking, okay, the audience isn't going to understand all this, so let's give a simplified version. But sometimes the, uh, I, I mean, I, I wrote some of them down, but I uh, didn't have time to collect them here, but sometimes the translation is, I'm just looking at my notebook because I had I had written some of them down because they were so odd. Um, oh yeah, here's one. Um, there's a phrase that she, uh, I think she or he uses, uh, Shabe Ki Shur, which means that old fashioned tune. Um, and it's just translated as old fashioned, which is the same, which isn't the same thing because music is such a big part of this film. And then there's the other thing, this is very much towards the beginning where he says, M.A. Pash, you pass the M.A. And it's translated into English as Western education. Well, I suppose it might be true that the only way you could get an M.A. degree is to be studying in English, but it's interesting to take M.A. Pash, which in my time when I grew up, M.A. Pash meant, okay, you, if you're B.A. Pash, that's not a big deal at all. You just passed the bachelor's degree. Everyone kind of probably has a BA Pash. But MA Pash is like higher educated and PhDs don't come into this picture. To, trans, to turn that into Western education means something very different. So there were, I mean, I think a lot of time could be spent going through line by line and figuring out why things like that were translated. Um, and I presume they were translated by somebody Bengali speaking uh, who translated them. So they made certain choices, um, but we didn't have time to get into that. Um, I, I know we have to wrap up soon, but I know Nizam has his hand up. 
So Nizam, go ahead. Uh, just one thing uh, regarding the translation of Gore Bai Re, uh, can we translate it as like the spiritual and the material? Gore Bai Re. That's it. Thank you. Um, uh, Butena's, yeah. Butena, go ahead, please. How are yeah, we doing I on just time? wanted to, I know we're, you know, unfortunately, you know, like we're being edged into the, uh, the sort of the, you know, the, the corners of, of the time or the, of the open time slot that we allotted ourselves. And I would like to spend, you know, more, uh, you know, as, uh, you know, as, as this conversation takes its different sort of paths, but uh, hopefully this, you know, this is the first of many, and I would love to hear from everybody, you know, your feedback on, you know, how this went and hopefully, you know, join us, uh, you know, in, in the sessions to come. Uh, but the, going back to your so your your question or comment about the selection of the film or to kick off with this film, I mean, you know, the, I could spend an hour talking about you know the sort of the pull of this particular title to start off with. You know, it's sort of a whether it's the sort of the the disruption of you know of uh, the luxury of isolation, like thinking about that concept as we you know as we kind of live in these in these times, you know, and and you know how that's relegated to a particular you know type of experience, a particular, you know, a viewpoint of, uh, you know, of what is considered to be safe, um, you know, the, what, you know, who is able to actually, you know, inhabit, uh, you know, the, the safety of, uh, you know, of, of, of a space or, iso or, or the safety or the luxury of isolation uh, in times of you know, perceived threat. Um, so that's, that's something that, you know, that's been going through uh, my mind, you know, in, in the past uh, at least month as, you know, as we, as the world takes uh, many sort of, you know, uh, turns in relationship to this, uh, to the condition that we find ourselves. Um, and, you know, the other aspect is the fact that, you know, not too long ago, I mean, the, the main discussion in, in, in many of our, you know, of our minds or, you know, or conversations is still the current, you know, sort of state of, you know, the nationalist rhetoric uh, in, in India, you know, and, and the, the sort of the weather, it's the, uh, you know, the, um, the, the protests that were happening as, you know, as, as, as unt until now, you know, and the way that they're being handled and the, you know, the NRC and, you know, and sort of this idea, the ability to protest and, uh, you know, and, and that being kind of an extension of the legacy of what we're able to see in this film as, you know, at, at, at that time. So kind of, you know, erasing that from our memory as, as sort of a part of our, you know, contemporary uh, kind of experience and the way that it kind of collides with this idea of the demand for a lockdown or the isolation and, you know, and, and, um, and that reality kind of governing the way that it will be handled in different, uh, you know, parts of the country or, you know, or, or in a segregationist or almost, uh, you know, manner. Uh, and we're seeing sort of uh, iterations of that in different parts, uh, whether it's through, you know, uh, you know, the preferential sort of, sort of discrimination of, you know, of, of whether it's treatment or the way that certain lockdowns are being implemented in certain parts. So all of these different things kind of came to fruition, you know, through this, uh, through this particular lens of RISE uh, work. So, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, that was sort of my, my thought on, on why we started with this and hopefully um, it leaves us with a lot more curiosity on his other work. As well, and you know, there he actually occupies a very special relationship with uh, Samakia's journey because his Apu trilogy, as you would have it, you know, was one of our first uh, series that we ran as a pop up in a in a gallery across the street from where we are right now. So there is something about this sort of full circle relationship with his commentary about different times that we find ourselves. So thank you, thank you again, Naim, for doing this, and uh, thank you everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for having us. I just wanted to also mention that if you get the chance, do see Charul Lota, the 64, 1964 film that I showed a short clip of. I think it's the perfect pairing to Ghore Bairi to see also two faces of uh, how Shoktojit Rai handled uh, Tagore's work. Um, and it's a beautiful film. You know, one thing I wanted to ask everybody actually was, was you know, what the experience was like watching the film you know, on uh, on your laptop or on your computer or on your different screens, because you know, this is our first experience, kind of having a discussion based on, you know, a VOD streaming uh, of one, especially a film like this. I mean, with that was shot, I think, on sixteen. Uh, you know, to have it, uh, you know, be thirty-five, I think. Thirty-five, thirty-five, yeah. You know, to have it kind of uh, be subjected to all these different treatments. <laughs> I'm wondering how that was for for for, for everybody. 
I, I actually did watch it on uh, Apple TV. So uh, the application of movies exists on Apple TV. And how was it? Amazing. Good. Very good. good. I also watched it on a, I mean, not a TV, but a large mo computer monitor. But of course, it was a lonely experience, right? Watching it on your own, uh, sitting in a office chair type contraption. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I don't know when we're going to be going back into cinema, but that's definitely something I think I miss. Hearing other people's reactions to films is also, of course, always so much of film viewing. Well, uh, I think that, okay, there are disadvantages, but the good thing is you can also go back, pause, and watch something in detail. So there are advantages too. Uh, but you have you, a lot of cinematography and a lot of detail and, and a lot of feel of a cinema, watching it in a cinema definitely is compromised when, it is when it's a smaller screen. But yes, there are advantages of just pausing and looking at and going back to a dialogue and looking at an expression. That has, uh, we have that advantage. So that's the difference. Thank for you. Me, um, for me, it's the nothing new. Um, I don't remember when last time I went to cinema hall. So I've been watching this on laptop for several years. And it worked well, yes. And I'm used to it. And I, I think it's kind of, you know, whenever I think this part is important, we every witness. That I can go back and pause. So it helps me. I guess, uh, yeah, Tima? Before maybe we say goodbye, I wanted to say something. I, um, while the discussion was happening, I realized there are so many connections between this film and the film we're going to discuss next week. So it would be great maybe to have some of you back for a discussion. I think it would be really interesting to zoom in and out. And, you know, they're very, two very different localities, but also there is a lot of um, connections as well between um, India, former USSR or Russia right now. So I, it would be really great to see some of you. Or all of you, if we can. Love to look forward to the invitation from Butena. I've shared the details of the film link and we'll be sending the uh, mailer uh, in a couple of days. So please look out for it and, uh, and do send us your feedback on, you know, how easy it was to access, uh, you know, the, the conversation, if things were not clear, um, if you're able. I know some people had some trouble accessing people who are tuning in from the U.S. Uh, we're on different uh, algorithms. Uh, <laughs> Um, between here and the U.S. territory, so some films drop out earlier. Uh, we're trying to adjust that uh, to make sure that the films we discuss are available to everybody in all geographies that are tuning in. But um, yeah, I, I look forward to hearing from you about this this experience, and um, and and you know, and we'll be sharing the information about the next film. Uh, Tima, if you want to say something about uh, about the, what what is expected, uh, what film and. Uh, and uh, anything about the session? I would just say, just bring some apples with you and I wouldn't say anything more. <laughs> thank you. With that, I leave the last word with you, Naim. And uh, I thank you on behalf of everybody at, uh, at Cinema Pay. Yeah, thank, uh, thank you everyone for joining and uh, hanging in there. We have almost everyone still there to the end and I know we were on for a long time. Um, I wasn't sure how it was going to work, as I said, talking about a film that we weren't watching together, but it actually went uh, quite well. We also all saw a different film in a way, in our different times. Also, one interesting thing for me about this experience, Butena, you mentioned the algorithm. So I didn't realize that was going on, actually. And, uh, you know, after this, I realized, oh, this is why I sometimes read reviews of films, go to movie, and they're not there, because different countries are seeing a different version of movie. Um, and I'm realizing that, you know, it's based on what uh, geographic region you're in. But there's other films to watch that somehow have not even appeared in front of where I'm living and I'm sure for others. So that's another aspect of this disembodied viewing experience. Yeah. That's, of course, I'm sure evolving as well.
Thank you for organizing this Butena and Cinema Akil team. Luz, Momo, everybody. Thank you, everyone. You'll be Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure joining the discussion. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Lovely. Thank Bye. you, everyone. Bye. Bye.